Some of you may remember that a tree fell down in my road and I had said that I saved this section out to maybe possibly make some ax handles out of or other tool handles. It's just a nice straight piece of trunk. It has a lot of rot in the center, so only the outside rind is usable. But I think we can get some good staves and I don't often have access to trees like this. Now the easiest way to do this is probably with you know steel wedges. I'm gonna use axes instead, but I think what I'm gonna do for you guys is do the initial one or two splits with just one ax and wooden wedges, just to show that it can be done and how you might go about that. Now, I don't wanna do the whole thing that way because it is gonna be slower. So the first thing I need to do is I need some wooden wedges and I need a maul, a big club of wood to beat on these because you don't wanna beat on you know your the back of your ax with a piece of steel very much. I mean, you can do a few taps here and there, not a big deal, but if you do it regularly, it'll mushroom. And almost every used ax that you get will have a mushroomed pole from someone either beating on it or they're using this to beat on a steel wedge or another ax. Am I worried about beating on these with a wooden uh, maul? Zero. That's very, very unlikely to cause any kind of problem or damage. It's green, so it's real heavy and it's just, it's just a temporary fix here. So we'll cut this one about this long. So one of the advantages to a boy's axe over a full-size axe is that you can use them with one hand, like a hatchet. Given that I want to get rid of a bunch of wood, I'm just going to try to get rid of that wood pretty fast. Waste that wood. If you just rounded this off and tried to use it, it would be awful. Awful! You need it much smaller. You get it straightened out a little bit here. And you know, keep in mind that there's a big difference between this, me being able to use this boy's ax for this job and it being good for this job. For most people, unless you're freaking Thor or something, it's gonna be awful heavy to use for very long. You have to take breaks and, but you can do it. Like if this was a, you know, three and a half pound ax, it would not be going too good. Not that you couldn't, you know, kind of pull it off, but. Okay, it curves like way over here, so I'm gonna get rid of some of this side. And then the rest of this, I wanna start coming in here pretty deep. Get rid of that stuff. So what you don't want to do with this kind of thing is just start whittling away at it like this from the start, like little nibbles and kind of like shaving it down a little bit at a time. Decide where you want the thing to be cut to and then try to get rid of that stuff pretty fast and use the, the fiddly whittly stuff to finish the thing up. Okay, that's still on the large side, but I'm probably just going to leave it in a fix it if it bugs me. Open owl, not the best knife for this job, probably not the best knife for anything, but it's lightweight, it's cheap, it fits in my pocket, and I've been carrying a lot because I want to test it. And I don't actually have a sheath knife that I really like right now anyway. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna look for is see if there are any cracks, which there aren't, that's good. I don't want any cracks. I'm gonna look for a knot. So there's a knot right here, it looks like. The bark's just weird right here. I can't see the knot, but I think there's a knot right here. So let's, let's mark that. There's a knot right here somewhere in this general vicinity. So I'm gonna kind of mark that. And otherwise this top looks real clear. 
And as far as the bark goes, let's see. Um, it goes slightly, just very slightly in this direction. I think right up in here it maybe turns a little, but it looks pretty good, so nothing to worry about there. So we'll make this our line right there. And I want to follow these radial lines right here, if you can see those. I'm going to come in, and I'm going to, I'm basically going to mark it. Get a split started, even if the axe won't stick and it won't go in there. It just defines exactly where I want this to go. Now see how easy it goes into the corner? It's going to go into that corner way, way easier than it's going to go into this face. And now I can start actually driving this. And you know, it looks so good that I don't think we're going to... It's pretty much likely that we don't actually need the wooden wedges. The thing is, um, because this is rotten in the middle, you know, the, the crack really only has to go to here. It doesn't have to go all the way to the other side. But we're going to make some wooden wedges anyway. And we're ready to do that. Forgot to extract my axe, <coughs> which just fell blade first into the gravelly driveway. No! It's ruined forever! What do we got here? Here, this one looks pretty good. Maybe we'll just experiment, make a couple different styles here. Now, the mistakes that people commonly make with wedges are making them uh, too fat in general and without flat sides. Here, I'll make I'll make a bad wedge first. You know, if I handed the average person an axe and said make a wooden wedge, they would end up making it with convex faces, you know, so it's it's got like a curve to the, the edge and you need that to be pretty straight or it'll tend to kind of squirt, squirt out of the split. Green wood is not ideal for this and these wedges will not hold up. I may have to throw them away and, and make new ones. It just depends on how much we need them and all that stuff. So the other option is I could run out and look for some dry wood. This wood is too soft. I mean, it has some resiliency and some rubberiness, but it's it's basically, it's just too soft because it's green and it's not that hard in the first place. Now, a lot of hard things are not very tough. Just make that edge just a little bit stronger. The other thing we want to do is round off all the corners. Um, it's not important if you're just going to use the thing really quick and throw it away like we are here actually, but it's good insurance and it doesn't take that long to just, you know, do that much and round those things off. Let's make one out of this. It's a little small to just split in half, so we'll just use the whole, the whole thing. We're gonna go, you know, from up here to the center of the stick and then come up here and do the same thing. One thing to really watch out for when you're working with sharp tools is if you can't see your digits, like I have a finger under here, and by experience, I kind of know that's unsafe to not be able to see it. But uh, quite a few injuries happen that way when people can't see their fingers because we rely so much on that to cue us into uh, what's going on. So I've got this thing going there, but this actually could still be a little bit too fat. So sometimes whether you like it or not, you need to come in and kind of thin the whole thing down and make that, that whole angle here just a little bit more acute than it might want to be. Especially this is a pretty small stick, but like on a bigger stick, it could be more of a problem. But you will also know if if your wedges keep squirting back out of the out of the splits, like you you probably need to make them a little bit more acute. Anyway, I was saying that you know some woods I could go get are much harder, but hard things are often brittle things. The the two are definitely not the same. In fact, they're often opposed. 
it's only very special materials that are both hard and tough. Among stones, that would be, say, jade. Um, steel is hard, both hard and tough. Glass is very hard. It's also very brittle. Stones, if you've made a wedge out of them like this, it's acute enough to actually go into the split and stay in the split. They would break because they're too brittle. Okay, we'll try that. Um, I think I'll just make one more like out of a piece of firewood here. Scored that, so let's just go with that split right there. Move the camera so you guys can see that a little bit better. Now this this wedge may be a little bit short and skinny, and occasionally, you know, if your wedge is not up to the job like that, it'll just disappear into the log <laughs> before you get the desired effect. You know, this log is splitting so easy that we do, we probably don't really need much of anything. But we may need like an extra wedge to uh, hold to open the log while we roll it over and get the other side or something like that. All right, so if you're out in the woods and you just want to split something real quick and you want to make a disposable wedge, you can just whack on it with your ax, um, but it's probably going to disintegrate. Um, what I'm going to try, the first thing I'm going to try is to take whatever's thin here, which is this, and try to get it into this split that I already started and see if it'll stay. Good. Yeah, it's kind of kind of bouncing out a bit. Even though it's, you know, pretty thin. And part of the reason, too, is the, the wood's green. Probably I should stick the axe back in the end. Get in it a little deeper in. And then try to chase it with the wood wedges. See how the salt goes here. Now this is probably just because, you know, the axe is thinner and it has a little bit more grip than this slippery green wood against um, slippery green wood. Let's see if we can get this to out of our way a little bit. So there's all kinds of things we could do from here. We could we could bring the ax closer, take this out and move it along, and very possibly do this whole job with a single wedge. We can, say, get this fat wedge in here. See if we can drive that in enough to stick well. Possibly release this one and move that. I mean, the thing is we're not going all the way through. So until we get a split down here, the log's just not gonna pop in half on us, or for us, rather. This is looking less straight than I thought it was. The split's kinda go, goes here, and it's right. Actually, that's not bad. Let's see, this looks a little thinner. So we can get this in over here. Splitting all the way through, good. So we do have a split going all the way through the log now. So it's just, it's pretty much gonna come right in half. No problem. Now if I'd really wanted it to split in an exact spot on the other side too, I would have, you know, I should have scored it and started it at the same time. Over there. Yeah, <laughs> so much for that wedge. Let's see if I can make it through. Yeah, that would just toast. Weak green wood. And 
now my my split is full of broken off wedge. There we go. Pretty neat. Wow, that looks cool. Yeah, what can we learn from this? Okay, so obviously all of this stuff right here is rotten and punky, but this looks, you know, real clean from there to there. There's some whiter sapwood here. Be able to see it, like a discoloration there or here, like where from about here out for about three quarters of an inch, it's whiter. That's less mature, uh, quite a bit weaker than this pink wood in here. My preference is to orient uh, handles kind of the traditional way with the grain this way. I mean, there's a lot of been people discussion about this lately, whereas before everyone was kind of like, you almost never heard anyone express a preference for grain running this way. Like in this ax handle, the grain runs this way, the growth rings of the tree run this way. And that's my preference personally, but I don't think it's a huge deal. But I think in terms of the way this tree is laid out and how much wood we have here to work with, because you know, there's about three quarters of an inch of wood here that's real white and that's the newest sapwood and it's really not that strong. So I kind of want to get rid of that. I'm not going to have much width here. So if I wanted to orient it this way with the growth rings of the, of the tree growing this way, which I don't, um, I wouldn't really be able to fit ax handles in here, but if I do it this way, I can, and that's good because that's how I want them to be. So I think uh, what I'm going to do is start by splitting these in half. And the reason is that uh, most woods in Tan Oak, I've, I've noticed this in particular, it doesn't want to split along the grain unless the two sides that you're splitting, like unless you split the bulk of the wood in half. So if you, if you take a mass and you split that mass in half, typically the split line is going to run pretty well through the grain, like right along the grain. Now, if I tried to go out here and say, like, I'm just going to split off one ax handle blank, like one stave, I start a split here. As this goes down, this is gonna bend away like that, and the split is gonna to travel towards this outside area, and it's gonna taper off. It's called run out. It's a really important concept in splitting. So it's gonna run out, run out, run out, and it's gonna get really skinny at the end. It's probably just gonna rip off the side, and then I won't have anything useful. Now, if I go in the middle first, and then I go along and say, okay, I can maybe divide that into three parts, then it's much more likely to follow the grain or hopefully even four parts. So I think I'm gonna take this one right here. It looks nice and straight right in that, that line right there. And I'm gonna split that in half and then we'll reassess. That doesn't help to run over my foot. Same thing, much easier to go into the corner of the wood instead of the face. Just do that, kind of get a start going. But then we're gonna come down a bit. Now that may not be biting and staying, but it's definitely starting the split. See how much easier that goes in now. I'll turn this around and Now, the other way we could do this and possibly not need any wedges is just to take the ax out and chase this. Why don't we do that for this split just to see how well it works. Also, with the right ax especially, if you can tell where it's going to split, which is, you know, it's kind of hard to tell because the bark will split weird. So like the split's going this way, but the bark's cracked out here. So it's kind of hard to tell what's going on. Anyway, I was going to say, you can also just chop, you know, and chase, chase this line along. If you're pretty sure that you, you know, have the accuracy and stuff, but it's really not usually going to be the best way to proceed. For most people with most axes and most logs in most circumstances, Again, this is easy to split because we're really just splitting a rind of wood. We're not splitting, you know, we're not actually splitting a 14 inch log. 
Okay, so my quandary is that if I split this in half where it's most likely to follow the grain really well and not, not run out at all, I'm going to have two big, long, big wide pieces of wood and I don't need them to be that wide. So I'm basically wasting an entire axe handle worth of material. Let's say that's one billet. Yeah, I'm barely going to squeeze three good billets out of this. And some of them I may end up going in half, but let's try the first one in thirds with this, which is going to be right about here. Looks like, yeah, like this radial line, if you can see that white line. Well, it's white up here and it's dark down there. I'd say there's actually a pretty good probability that this is going to run out and be ruined. So here's the things I'm going to do. You know, I got I got my split started here, and now I'm going to come back immediately with another axe directly behind this one. We'll know more after this split how things are going to behave. It'd be so much easier if this bark was peeling, and then I could also save the bark. I'm just gonna wail into this and say, hey, you know, I can just hit this hard. It'll just run that split right down, which it will. But by chasing the split, I'm more likely to get it to go where I want and avoid running. Right because it's almost like I'm starting the split over again. I may not take any of these precautions as I go along and split the rest of these staves out, but it's just a matter of, uh, I wanna see what happens with this first one and be a little cautious. I know how easy this run out happens. Okay, now that we're near the end, I can just go for it. Looks real good. And this, there was a, maybe a knot in this area somewhere. Maybe it's right here, I think is, is what's going on. There's definitely a 30 inch handle at least. Uh, this is 27 inches long. I'm happy about that. I probably could even get a 32 inch handle out of that. Uh, remember too that with this one now, we're splitting this in half. So that should go really smooth. We don't have to worry about any of that run out stuff. I think I'm gonna go ahead and chop out some of this part. There's a dummy roll that you should never ever put your foot on the piece of wood that you're chopping. How do you get by without ever doing that? I mean, I feel like 99.9% .9 safe doing this. Um, I'm not arcing the ax like this. I'm pushing it down a little bit. And that foot right now was, you know, it's a handy tool that I need. I must be getting into the good wood over there. This stuff might make pretty good tinder. It's like real spongy. If you dry this out, it's also very porous. It has like a uh, airy structure. So if you dry this out and char it real well, you could catch sparks with a 
flint and steel, probably. Never know until you try it. But. As far as, you know, a, a natural char or char cloth substitute for catching sparks uh, by flint and steel. Punky wood's the one I've used the most. I don't think I've ever used tan oak punk in particular, but. Oh, by the way, you could also make bows out of this wood. I'm sure. I don't think it's probably the best bow wood, but I'm pretty sure my friend Joe DeBill, uh, now deceased. R.A.P. Joe. Joe was uh, an amazing character. Very knowledgeable, very skilled. And not just that, but like, I don't know, he lived with a lot of zest. He used to be like a cross country runner and he just went and spent tons of time out in the woods because he got interested in like survival and primitive skills. Uh, started making bows and hunting with bows. Just kind of like manically lived his life. All my older friends that I made friends with when I was younger in the primitive skill scene are a lot of Seems like a lot of guys are dying now. Steve Watts passed away. Um, one of my flint napping teachers, Peter Ainsworth. Jim Riggs, of course. Okay, the other thing you can do with this is kind of beat the ax in that direction. Oh, there's a knot right there. So this piece of wood's probably only good from there to there, but again, that's enough to, uh, yeah, that's enough to make even a full-size ax handle. Cool, man, this is fun. Isn't this fun, you guys? I've been dying to get up here and do this. Okay, the question is, do I just chase this one down like I did before, or do I take the cautious route? What does this look like? It looks pretty good up to right here. I think this is a good one to experiment on and just go ahead and let's just go for it. See if it runs out or not. Okay, now the, you see it's just bouncing out. I'm gonna have to come out here and chase that along a little bit. Let's just come all the way over here. Let's see if we can drive the ax. I'm gonna pull up on the handle a little bit every time I hit it and try to jump it, you know, jump the handle up and then drive the ax. Yeah, it's running out. I'm mean, still gonna get a good stave out of this, but it definitely ran out. You can just see it. Look at these brake lines, brake. It's just tapering off. So this is the phenomenon of grain run out. This stave kind of went south after about uh, two thirds of the way down anyway. So I still have a, a reasonably good stave, I hope, from about here down. But see, this is, this is why I chased that first one. So this is where I thought there was a knot right there and it looks like it, it, it is kind of going around. Yes, your ax handle is a lever, but you better watch it. Certainly not well suited for the job, but why not use it to the extent that it works?
All right, I got a variety of uh, wood loaded up here. It's just, you know, random limbs and pieces of firewood and then all the staves. Maybe one or two turned out too small to make ax handles with, but that doesn't mean they won't be useful for something else. I'm thinking maybe some like hoe and shovel type handles for garden tools, because that's a big problem too. I mean, I have those things break and I usually don't go buy a new one. So I have kind of a pile of nice tools that need handles. And my impression of tan oak, if I had to say from handling and working with it a little bit, um, having only made like hatchet handles, which aren't under a ton of stress, I would say that it's stiff, but a little bit brittle. Uh, that's, that's what I would kind of characterize it as. The other possibilities, you could make bows out of this wood. And for that, I would guess it's kind of like so-so. If you made a sinew-backed bow, for sure. If you followed like Tim Baker's kind of safe rules of bow making, making bows extra wide, um, you know, follow, either following a single growth ring or making the grain oriented more vertically, uh, like a quarter sawn style, that you could probably make a, a nice bow out of it, is my guess. If I don't seal the ends, they're gonna crack. Um, I mean, you need to get those down to a smaller dimension, like the smallest dimension I can get away with uh, for what I wanna make out of it. So if I wanna make an axle, I'm gonna leave some extra, but get it down to like a, a solid billet. The thinner a piece of wood is, the less stress develops as it's drying and the less likely it is to check. We'll talk about that in detail sometime. Uh, my mall here got chewed up real bad just doing that little bit. I mean, this is not the toughest wood. It's completely green and I'm hitting, you know, steel with it. So it's no small wonder that it kind of got chewed up. But I'll, I'll just keep this around until it becomes not useful anymore. I mean, you might as well. This is a pretty good haul here. I have, um, you know, most of these I could get an ax handle out of that it's at least 32 inches. It's just a matter of like, sometimes there's a knot and some like wavy grain where I might want to cut it off. But even then, like almost all of them have like a 30 inch ax handle, just a few of them don't. If there's any where it's just straight all the way through for a long distance, I'll keep that full length. But if there's like a knot, like say in this one, there's a knot right there, I'll just chop it off at the knot and save that piece separate. But that spot on the road basically doesn't get any sun at all. Down here in the open and it's drier, it's windier, they're gonna start cracking pretty fast. I need to seal both ends of every log. I'm not gonna deal with any of the rest of it, cutting it, hewing it down, taking off the bark, etc. So I'm gonna use paint because it's easy and I have a ton of it. We have this like free paint depot, like the Toxics drop-off place. You can go and get like five gallon buckets of paint. You you can also use uh, fat beeswax or any wax, pine pitch, anything that's gonna stop or slow down that drying. So I'm gonna do this end real quick and then I'm gonna go cook some lunch and when I'm done with lunch, that should be dry. I can flip these around, do the other end, get them stacked in the shade. Even so, I will probably cover them with a tarp or something just to kind of like keep it damper and slow down drying a little bit um, until I get them uh, further processed because that could take who knows? I mean, weeks. Who knows how long that's going to take me. What's up with that? Oh, there's a cut. Dude, you're getting paint on your axe. Oh, no. I got paint on my axe. Ideally, this paint would go actually over the sides a little bit, but it, it's not really necessary, I don't think, um, for the short term. Because this is kind of temporary because as soon as I cut these to size I'm gonna have to paint the other end again anyway. If uh, they were lighter and smaller I'd probably just dip the ends.